Science Uncut, presented by the Volkswagen Foundation. We live in an immigration society for scientific knowledge. New facts, models, theories and technologies enter our social fabric at an unprecedented space. Scientists build, rebuild, but sometimes destroy the way of life we humans are used to. Most of the time for good. Imagine human societies as a way of playing chess with the scientific progress, constantly putting new figures on the chessboard and changing the rules of the game for better or for worse. Today it is a truism to say science made the modern world. As a result of our society's reliance on the scientific knowledge, progress in arcane disciplines can undermine trusted and tested regulations and norms. Understanding the immigration of knowledge, synchronizing its factual, social and temporal dimensions to act wisely is a necessity. Science and technology creates a complex socio-ecological system on which the sustainability of our modern societies depend more and more. In such a situation, it is a no-brainer to claim that our societies need to study man-made existential and pot potentially catastrophic risks that are of global concern and may require focused international efforts. We increasingly face collective action problems, like the man-made global warming, a situation in which humans so far act as if a technological change can substitute for social change. As a sociologist and historian of innovation system, Rogers Hollingsworth once observed, clearly one of the great challenges of our time is to create a new theory of governance for coordinating institutions nested in a world of unprecedented complexity, one in which sub-national regions, nation states, continental and global regions, all are intricately linked. Effective democratic governance in the 21st century requires democracy and an informed citizenry with the knowledge about major issues of the day, not only at the level of the nation state, but at each of the levels mentioned above. Hollingsworth warns in his essay, Rethinking Democracy, that a number of uncontrollable historical forces are reversing the potential of modern society to be democratic. This observation brings me to my first public expectation towards scientists. What is needed is humility, accepting the dense and piled world we live in. The modern scientist cannot be a priest. What the modern scientist may have left as a basis of authority is a kind of independence and a notion of scientific integrity. Even this authority is endangered, endangered if scientists want to be decision makers who act and drive forward fast. Publics will be more and more asking, who are you scientists? Do you behave so that we can trust you? Can we safely defer problem solving to experts? What most of us do all the time and have to do. With the ever increasing experimental power and the growing diversity of scientific disciplines, nobody can claim to grasp precisely what may well happen. At journalist, journalitis, moneyitis, and administrativitis, as worrisome trends inside the science communication system, and you can understand why certain publics worry about systemic risks of science to society. As I said, we live in an immigration society for scientific knowledge, for the good. So we need many vigilant immigration officers at the border zones between science and society. We need, as the French philosopher Bruno Latour suggests, a parliament of things to come. So what then is a biosecurity issue from a public perspective? I will focus on this. In my view, dile the dilemma can be described simply. Very basic research can sometimes undercut regulations put in place to protect us. So sometimes the freedom of science must find its limits. Why? Think about a man-made, potentially pandemic pathogen escaping accidentally or willfully recreated. This PPP could behave like an atomic bomb with implemented self-reproduction. Its impact could well be more damaging than many nuclear weapons fired off. It is the dimension of the possible damage that is the genuine public concern. As a professional science journalist, I learned that Ron Fouché and his team had created what he himself claimed at the time, later corrected, to be probably one of the most dangerous viruses you can make. You all know that story. 
But he nevertheless wanted to publish the recipe on how to make it as soon as possible. And my science editor at the German newspaper Frankfurter Allgemeine Sonntagszeitung could see it immediately that scientists had just encountered another Asilomai moment in which we would be important for researchers to establish trust with the public about what they do and what they know, what they don't know, and what needs to be learned. As science journalists, we felt the debate would be about trust in scientists, but also hubris, the very antithesis of prudence. We knew the debate would center on biosafety as well as biosecurity. In the end, about who can and who should regulate dual use research of concern, sometimes before experiments are done, sometimes. We knew at the time the debate would be about codes and regulation, the clarification of benefits and risks and the tough questions whether some red lines for certain types of gain of function experiments can make the world a safer place or not. In this situation, we tried to be reporters of what was happening in an extremely difficult situation, which many are not. So what does the public need to know about dual use research of concern on microbes? First and foremost, that there is legitimate concern among scientists themselves. One way to write about this is science journalism is to imagine possibilities. Researchers will be able to edit, edit, correct, and sometimes write in new codes for potentially pandemic pathogens, which so far natural evolution has not created. Some have argued that humans can't make like forms that nature did not evolve. Pandemic influenza, smallpox, Ebola, and many other horrible diseases have evolved in nature, and science is indeed our best chance to combat some of these plagues, maybe most of them. However, so far, H5N1 bird flu viruses have not ignited the human pandemic, despite millions of killed chicken. So far, airborne Ebola virus has not emerged after thousands of transmissions in West Africa. And a novel form of HIV, which travels from lung to lung, has not evolved naturally after millions of passages worldwide. It may never do so. Maybe it doesn't need to adapt. Of course, as we all know, absence of evidence is on a risk is not evidence of absence. But now look at what happens in a lab with experimental methods which can relax or even overcome natural constraints. In selective screens, you can get what you select because you simulate and accelerate natural evolution by technical means. A scientist with good, but sadly also one with malicious intention, can't possibly select dangerous microbes the world has never seen. In my view, the historical legacy of world-class influenza scientists competing for reputation will be that many more people in the world now know in principle the recipe on how one could maybe create a pandemic bird flu virus. The horse may be out of the barn, but so regulation to further control this risk may seem futile. But my conclusion is a different one. I would argue that we need to better understand system-wide vulnerabilities through horizontal and honest reviews, precisely because we are just at the beginning of an area. Powerful methods of forced molecular evolution combined with the tools of synthetic biology will force societies to regulate the emergent field of proportionally to its risks, of course. We need to think hard about possible red lines so scientists can continue legitimate research responsibly, which we all need. For example, if it becomes fashionable to work on new, more virulent and transmissible PPPs, for example, H5N8, H7N9, MERS, Ebola viruses, society needs to balance a very delicate risk type. Some call this risk type a ruin risk problem, where the risk of unintentional or intentional release is low, but with non-zero probability that can result in unrecoverable loss. Individual and societies have always had trouble dealing with ruin risks, because a classical cost-benefit analysis doesn't help much. Ruin risk problems uh, are like black swans in the middle of millions of white ones. In the presence of risk of black swans, unforeseen and unforeseeable ex events of extreme consequences may happen, but the prob probability of realizing the ruin risk may be impossible to calculate. What should we humans decide in such situations? The precautionary principle states that if an action or policy has a suspected risk of causing severe and potentially harm to the public domain, the action should not be taken in the absence of scientific near certainty about its safety. In such a situation, the burden of proof about absence of harm falls on those proposing an action, not those opposing it. Accepting this logic, the public expectation towards scientists can be stated precisely. Is there a class of gain-of-function experiments, which PPPs, that can be described as a kind of collective ruin-risk problem in which policymakers 
would have the responsibility to avoid potentially catastrophic harm to society. If there is even immediate benefit, high probability outcomes would possibly not outweigh the existence of low probability but infinite cost options. In Germany, there was a recent ruling by the High Court about a conceived collective ruin risk that may seem ridic ridiculous for you, but still I will tell the story. A concerned citizen lodged a constitutional complaint because she felt that the new Large Particle Collider at the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN in Switzerland, could possibly create black holes. The citizen feared the planned experiments could, according to a theory, lead to the destruction of the world. In case of theoretical predictions, uh, of the scientists' experts failed. Therefore, she urged the High Court to stop the experiment. So the Bundesverfassungsgericht uh, turned this appeal on the constitutional issue down, but used an interesting reasoning, and I quote, the dimension of a presumed damage, in this case the destruction of Earth, does not allow a waiver on the elucidation that there is at least a hypothetically thinkable coherence between the experiment and the damaging event. For a presentation of the possibility of such an occurrence of damage, and it's notably not sufficient to support warnings only on a general distrust, distrust towards physical laws or towards theoretical arguments of the natural sciences. In other words, the court felt that there would need to be a real scientific controversy whether at CERN black holes could materialize, which is obvi obviously not the case. This brings me to my second public issue with dual-use research of concern on microbes. It is the immaterial nature of the genetic code. Michael alluded already to that. What do I mean by this? All institutions that try to regulate biosecurity risks of certain experiments make the assumption that the material transport of select agents can be controlled or minimized if scientists working in approved biosafety labs take great care that the products of accepted research do not end up materially in the wrong hands. To see what I mean, look at the access regime to control re research of the remaining smallpox virus stocks. All the regulations try to prevent the undesirable propagation of the remaining variola virus through the control of access to the material objects, the virus stocks, the DNA, and so on. Such regimens make sense only so long as progress make, makes it feasible to recreate the extant pox virus from its genetic sequence published in databases. Even if a completely secure biosafety lab stores the PPP forever in the freezer, third party could soon recreate any pathogen, pathogen from scratch. With synthetic genomics only if bits of the viral sequence enter the public domain. In the not-too-distant future, people will be able to resurrect variola virus without material access to the remaining stocks. Also, human transmissible H5N1 influenza viruses could be recreated using comparable techniques if a sequence is available. It is in my view that the immaterial character of the genetic alphabet undermines biosafety and biosecurity regulations and export control regimes that try to minimize the spread of dual-use goods. As a matter of fact, a simple email in fact the sequence of a man-made PPP intercepted inside a lab could be a possible entry point for the malicious dissemination, whether scientists like it or not. It is the immaterial character of genetic information why we need to debate in public about red lines for some areas of basic research. A debate. I would submit that if you want to avoid certain type of ruin risks of certain classes of experiments, Researchers should sometimes not perform them in the first place. But as a science journalist, of course, I'm not the one to decide. My role is to ask questions in the interest of the public. So let me finish with a short list of points to consider. The first, scientists urgently should identify types of gain-of-function experiments with PPPs, if there are any, where a red line or at least a moratorium would make sense in your perspective. For example, discuss an airborne transmissibility gain-of-function experiment with an Ebola as a case study. We discussed it not yet, but we could. Second, if research with the potential for realizing a ruin risks is allowed, the public needs to know what precautions are taking to avoid the risks of unintentional or unintended release. How do actors make sure, for example, that in others in countries with less strong biosafety regulations do not release a PPP by accident? Who bears the liability in case of failure? That's what the public needs to know. Third, for experiments with ruin risk potential already done, the question remains, how should we deal with the immaterial character of genetic information? 
in non-zero probability but potentially catastrophic risk situations. And I'm only talking about these ones. And there are very few. The fourth, what kind of immediate benefit do societies miss if policies stop certain experiments? Who decides who should be allowed to experiment in situations where a possible ruin risks for public global goods goes hand in hand with an immediate benefit of the research? How should we deal with efforts in the military domain to create, for example, an airborne Ebola strain to test the efficacy of human Ebola vaccines? So I hope I could convince you that, uh, in my view, the dual-use research of concern dilemma is indeed a dilemma. And it is a dilemma because it's a very complex collective action problem. I would submit, therefore, that it is in the public interest not just to discuss, but that actors act together and follow a collective impact strategy. What I take from this meeting so far is that lots of very clever people agree on saying, I'm not the only solution. And that's true. I mean, the journals are not the only solutions. You scientists are not the only solutions. And even the courts or the ethics council is not the only solution. It's a collective act action problem. And it's a serious one. And we get more and more collective action problems piling up and without simple solutions on a global scale. That's what Hollingsworth was kind of referring. So I can safely say that this is my serious public concern. As Celia Fennegy, an expert in international law and a member of the German Access Council, told me in an interview for our newspaper, we still don't have a coherent system. We only have regulations that do not match the possible threats of bioterrorist challenges in the 21st century. And I was only talking about these. And uh, thank you for listening uh, to a science journalist at such a high-profile meeting. And I hope we will have an interesting discussion.